Hello everyone, I am Boofire191, and this is Earth in Star Wars 3. And it is time to get to the good stuff. The thing that draws most people to Star Wars. The wars. The Clone Wars is on its second year, and the galaxy has entered a gridlock. Every time the Republic claims a world, the CIS conquers a different one. New strategies need to be executed. New allies need to be gained. Something has to give. Someone has to do something bold. This is where Earth comes in. As I stated in my last two videos, Earth would want to avoid war at all costs. They just don't have the means of fighting a galactic conflict. However, they are a tempting target due to their massive economy. So who is going to attack Earth, you may be asking? Well, it's the Separatists, and don't worry, I'll explain why. Earth hasn't done anything to the Republic, and has been a reliable trade partner for a decade. Senators would fight any declaration of war that could emerge in the Senate, due to the fact that a war with Earth would be pointless as well as costly, because again, they haven't done anything. Now Palpatine could try to create a conspiracy that implicates Earth as a threat, but he would have a difficult time doing this. You see, the intelligence agencies of Earth are filled with deceitful and despicable motherfuckers. I guarantee you that these people would infiltrate many facets of galactic society. It's hard to orchestrate a conspiracy with many moving parts if people you don't control are looking into it. Something, up to that point, Palpatine hasn't had to deal with. Side note, at this time, Palpatine didn't have full control of the Senate, which means he can't just pass legislation. He needs the Senate's okay. However, the Separatists are a different story. Dooku and the actual Separatist leaders have pulled the wool over the eyes of the Separatist Parliament, which means they can do things without asking Parliament, or they can lie and get what they want done. Done. Now, Palpatine would see Earth as a possible threat for the future. Within a decade, Earth has grown into a minor galactic power, who is sitting almost uncontested in the unknown regions. Earth also has a positive opinion of alien species due to the refugees who moved to the colonies and are powering this powerhouse of an economy. If given another decade or two of undisturbed peace, Earth could become a major force comparable to the huts if they are not stopped or brought to heel. So using this puppet, Palpatine orders Dooku to attack Earth. Since the Parliament has no real say on military matters, as well as having complete faith in Dooku, the CIS would go to war with Earth. Now, this would not be a formal declaration, but rather a surprise attack similar to Pearl Harbor. And so it begins. The unaware populace of Earth goes about its day. The fleets from all the neighboring nations above Earth patrol and watch for signs of trouble, and then it hits. The Separatist fleet drops out of orbit and hits the shocked forces of Earth. Initially, Earth loses several vessels, but they've prepared for this. In one moment, Earth's fleets pull out and retreat into hyperspace. A signal is sent to all of Earth's ships across the galaxy, telling them to meet at the rendezvous. They were now at war. The CIS begins their invasion, aiming for the most populated places on the planet. However, unlike the rest of the galaxy, Population does not mean importance. Believing Earth to be weak, and not understanding the sheer size of Earth's army, the Separatists attack with three full armies of 218,000 droids. The total number of this group would range just under 700,000 in total. Vulture droids and hyena droids clash with the experienced pilots of Earth in an aerial ballet of twisted metal. As the droids land, however, they begin to realize they made a mistake. This isn't Naboo, this isn't Ryloth. This isn't a world with a token security force of a few thousand. This is Earth. At first, the droids attacking the cities of Tokyo, New York, and Sao Paulo, the three largest cities in the world, meet expected resistance. But a few days pass, and with their air support decimated by the better trained and greater numbered air forces of Earth, the droid armies clash with the armies of Earth. Without a 10 to 1 advantage, the droid armies are decimated, but the fleet remains in orbit. Earth had a feeling war would come to their planet, so they prepared accordingly. The fleet is too precious to lose, so in its battle plan, the nations of Earth agreed to pull out their vessels so they can build their strength and attack at a time of their choosing. 
This meant fighting a ground war, which they believed they could do, due to their experience, as well as the fact that they knew the largest of the CIS armies deployed in combat were made up of a few million droids. Something minuscule when you're dealing with a planet that has a standing army of 14 million. They also knew by examining the battles waging across the galaxy, the Separatists would attack the most populated areas on the planet, due to those being the most important areas on most worlds. This allowed Earth to prepare accordingly. The initial battle for Earth would be a defeat for the Separatists, but with the blockade in orbit, Earth was not out of hot water yet. Across the galaxy, at the Council of Neutral Systems, Representative Kissinger of Earth calls on his allies to come to their aid. They don't. The neutral worlds never trusted Earth, and will not send their people to die. Earth is alone. Or so they think. News spreads quickly about the destruction of a sizable Separatist army. The humans of Earth have... spirit. And the rest of the galaxy sees this. With their previous dealings with Mandalorian mercenaries and experience with Mandalorian culture, Representative Kissinger begins looking for allies among the divided Mandalorian people. Across the galaxy on Raxus Prime, the Separatist Parliament, shocked at what just happened, debate their next course of action. Seeing full well that Earth is without a doubt a threat, Palpatine orders another, much larger invasion of Earth, and if need be, the destruction of the planet. Dooku finds this to be a tall order. Earth is a resource-rich world who never did anything to the Separatists. So to convince Parliament to go to war, Dooku had to say that the ends justify the means. The conquest of one world could bring the war to an early end, but if it was destroyed, questions would be asked. Back on Earth, the UNSC develops a plan to take out the orbiting fleet without risking their larger vessels. On Earth, there's a weapon considered primitive by the rest of the galaxy, but no less destructive. Nuclear weapons. With access to a massive amount of these weapons, as well as thousands of landing craft, a simple strategy is developed. With fighter support, the landing craft will fly into and land inside the CIS ships. Marines will exit their craft and try to take control of the ship. They get to fight on their own turf, fight on the ground. If they succeed, Earth gains a new ship. If they fail, the Marines or landing craft pilots will detonate the warheads destroying the ship and killing everyone on board. But before this plan can be launched, the Separatists come back with a massive fleet and army with a force of 2 million, larger than the army present during the Battle of Geonosis, the CIS, understanding that numbers were not on their side, for once, attack the site of the UN. Hoping to cut the head off the snake, they send all of their forces to New York City. Unfortunately for them, they don't understand how the nations of Earth operate. American, Canadian, and UN forces clash in New York, as the city is reduced to rubble. Getting word that the fleets have come together and are at full strength, the UNSC begins its desperate assault on the orbiting armada. As the ground forces on Earth engage the CIS, and the air forces engage the CIS strike craft, the fleet arrives and clashes with the enemy armada. The retrofitted Republic cruisers engage and take the brunt of the fighting. All the ships Earth built herself fire their massive railguns and tear the CIS frigates and cruisers apart. The flight is bloody and destructive. Earth loses ships left and right, as do the Separatists. But winning the air battle back on Earth, all forces not supporting the Battle of New York are diverted to space. The UNSC launches every fighter, bomber, and landing craft it has. The air forces guard the landing craft to their destination, and as the battle rages, the CIS ships closest to Earth explode in a ball of nuclear fire, or turn on their own, and fire on other CIS ships. Caught in a pincer, the superior CIS fleet attempts to flee, but it's too late. The 13 looser hulks that carried the droid army may be formidable, but they are too slow and too big. They cannot maneuver in the tight formations they now find themselves in. Be it the captured vessels now under the UNSC's command, the United Earth Fleet, or derelict hulls from the battle the CIS have no clear avenue for escape. Just like Hannibal Barca at the Battle of Cannae, the Earth fleet closes its pincers on the CIS fleet. Whatever they failed to capture is destroyed. Only a handful of small vessels are able to jump to hyperspace. 
Earth is victorious, but the cost was heavy. New York City was destroyed in the fighting, and humanity sustained catastrophic losses. In the months directly after the fighting, Earth would lick its wounds, and Kissinger would return with whoever they could find to aid humanity's cause. In that time, Earth would conscript a large portion of the population. Considering current military strength and Earth's population, the planet could levy two billion soldiers given enough time. After the devastating loss, the Separatists and Palpatine would think twice before trying another attack on Earth. While the planet begins its buildup, Earth would look for new avenues of equipping its fleet and army. This avenue would be the Republic Senate. At this time, Palpatine did not have absolute power over the Senate, so in order to acquire more ships and equipment, Earth would approach the Republic with a simple proposition. Give us ships, and we will attack the Separatists. For the Warhawks, this would be a win-win. They're trading supplies for trained soldiers who will aid in the war effort. For those who want peace, they would support this action due to the fact that Earth was attacked unprovoked. They need a means of defending themselves. For the rest of the war, Earth would attack and destroy valuable CIS targets. But, with limited numbers, they would not be able to conquer and hold worlds. Also during this time, a united Earth would start to form. Earth is a major player now, and the nations cannot survive on their own. Refugees would also flock to the colonies, and Earth would continue capturing military equipment from the Separatists, be it ships, droids, weapons, you name it. By the end of the Clone Wars, Earth would continue to aid the Republic in its operations. But when Order 66 comes down and the Republic is reformed into the Empire, humanity would pull back to the unknown regions and prepare for the dark times ahead. So with all that said again, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I've been Boofire191, and I know this series is a bit fanfiction-y, but I'm trying to keep it grounded in reality. Um, tell me what you think about this down below. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all later. Goodbye.